This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Vice President Joe Biden said Thursday it'll take a, quote, hell of a long fight for the United States and its allies to stop the advance of militants from the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. But during the same speech, Biden admitted the Islamic State poses no existential threat to the nation's security. His comment comes as Australia becomes the latest country to join the U.S.-led fight. Prime Minister Tony Abbott said Australian planes will take part in the air campaign and that special Special forces would be deployed. The Americans uh, certainly have uh, uh, quite a substantial uh, special forces component on the ground already. Um, uh, my understanding is that there are UK and Canadian special forces already uh, inside Iraq. Uh, so uh, we'll be uh, operating um, on a much smaller scale, but. Uh, in an entirely comparable way to the United States Special Forces. Meanwhile, Turkey's parliament has authorized the government to order military action against the Islamic State. The mandate also allows foreign troops to launch operations from Turkey. According to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, ISIS militants have seized more than 350 North Syrian villages in the past 16 days, displacing at least 300,000 people. To talk more about the crisis in the Middle East, we're joined by Jeremy Skehu, who first reported from inside Iraq before the 2003 U.S. invasion. He's co-founder of TheIntercept.org and author of the book Dirty Wars, The World is a Battlefield. The paperback version of the book has just been published. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Jeremy, and congratulations on the book being uh, published as a paperback talk about the war in Syria and Iraq now. Well, you know, for, first of all, it's it's sort of like uh, the, the terrorist flavor of the month that we're dealing with here. <clears throat> you know, first we had al-Qaeda is this huge global threat. Then it was ISIS. And then the Khorasan group, uh, you know, was produced. And the thing is, almost no one in Syria had ever heard of the Khorasan group. In fact, my understanding is that it was a term that was sort of used in the U.S. intelligence community and actually isn't the, the name of the people that they claim to be attacking. And um, what, what the, the entire policy boils down to is that the Obama administration has, in a very Orwellian way, uh, changed the definition of commonly understood terms, uh, primarily the term imminent. They are saying that the Khorasan group represented an imminent threat to the United States. But we know from a leaked white paper uh, that was put out in advance of John Brennan's confirmation to be the uh, CIA director uh, that the Justice Department actually has officially changed the definition of the word imminent so that it does not need to involve an immediate uh, uh, threat against the United States, that it could be a perception that maybe one day uh, these individuals could possibly attempt to plot, not even carry out, uh, a, a terrorist attack against the United States. That flimsy justification has been used now to expand uh, this war uh, from uh, Iraq to Syria, potentially beyond. Um, you know, the, the Obama administration, uh, in, in engaging in this policy, uh, is continuing a Bush administration outcome of the decision to invade Iraq, and that is it's em they're empowering the very threat that they claim to be fighting. Um, who is ISIS? What, what is this group made up of? Is it just people that are uh, radical Islamists that want to behead American journalists? No. One of the top—and this almost is never mentioned in corporate media coverage of this—one of the top com military commanders of ISIS um, is a man named Izzat Ibrahim al-Duri al-Takridi. Who is Izzat Ibrahim? Izzat Ibrahim is the leading Ba'athist who was on the deck of cards that the United States has not captured. He was one of Saddam Hussein's top military commanders. He was uh, not just some ragamuffin Ba'athist. He actually was a, a hardcore uh, general in the Iraqi military during the Iran-Iraq War, um, and he was a secular Ba'athist. Why is he fighting with ISIS? Well, when, when Bush decided to invade Iraq, and then he put Paul Bremer, who was a radical neocon ideologue who had cut his teeth working for Henry Kissinger, when Paul Bremer was put in charge of the occupation of Iraq, one of the first things he did was to fire uh, 250,000 Iraqi soldiers simply because they were members of the Ba'ath Party. As one senior U.S. official at the time said, it was the day we made a quarter of a million enemies in Iraq. All of these Ba'athists have been jerked around by the United States, and the Sunnis in western Iraq jerked around by the United States for a very long time. Uh, there was the period of the so-called surge where the U.S. actually paid Sunnis not to kill the United States, uh, you, you know, U.S. soldiers. Um, and, and so, and, and, but then the U.S. turned around and put in power 
a Shiite-led government uh, under Nouri al-Maliki uh, that effectively operated um, a, a network of death squads that, that systematically attacked Sunnis. So the point I'm making here is, yes, there's an element uh, of ISIS, I don't know how dominant it is within the group, that uh, is, you know, trying to establish the caliphate. And they are beheading people. And they are imposing a very strict interpretation of Sharia law. But there are also, uh, and, I, and I would suspect that they're best military figures, uh, there is also a large contingent of people that are fighting the same battle that they were fighting when the United States originally invaded. Uh, the fact is there was no al-Qaeda presence in Iraq uh, before George W. Bush took that made the decision to invade it, except in the Kurdish region in the north of Iraq, which was not under Saddam Hussein's control. In fact, it was under the control of U.S.-backed entities, and that was Ansar al-Islam. Saddam Hussein's forces were fighting that group. So, so what, what, what am I saying here? What I'm saying is that the United States, through its policies, created the very threat that it claims to be fighting now. And in continuing this policy, what President Obama is doing is embracing uh, the very lies that made the Cheney-Bush-Iraq war possible. And in the process, he's creating yet another generation of people in the Islamic world who are going to grow up in a society where they believe that their religion is being targeted, uh, where they believe that the United States is a gratuitous enemy. And, uh, and, and, and so this is sort of an epic formula for blowback. According to Yahoo News, the Obama administration's acknowledged a policy announced last year calling for near certainty for no civilian casualties in drone strikes will not apply to the current bombing. The admission came in response to queries about a strike that killed up to a dozen civilians in the Syrian village of uh, Kafr Daryan last week. Right. I mean, this is, this is a kind of kabuki drone theater here, because the reality is that even in their drone strikes that are supposedly done with precision and every, you know, every uh, precaution is taken not to kill civilians, um, the reality is that they've created a mathematical uh, process <laughs> for churning out the number of civilians killed in drone strikes that will always result in zero. Because if they kill a so-called jackpot, the target that they're, they're aiming for, and they kill other unknown individuals, the system that the Obama administration, the U.S. military, and the CIA have developed is that anyone who is an EKIA, enemy killed in action, uh, is someone who we don't have proof that they're innocent. You know, in other words, it's sort of a reversal of the idea that you're, you're innocent until proven guilty. If you are near someone that the U.S. was intending to kill, uh, the presumption is that you are an EKIA, you're an enemy killed in action, unless someone can prove that you weren't. And, and I mean, most of these drone strikes we don't know anything about. So in a way, the fact that they're saying this um, it has actual, actually very little meaning, except that they're going to have even less regard for civilian lives than they already do through their kabuki theater with their existing drone program. Let me ask you about uh, former Defense Secretary Leon Panetta, um, the book that's coming out, Worthy Fights. Um, he writes, in the fall of 2011, it was clear to me and many others that withdrawing all our forces would endanger the fragile stability, then barely holding Iraq together. To this day, I believe a small U.S. troop presence in Iraq could have effectively advised the Iraqi military on how to deal with al-Qaeda's resurgence and the sectarian violence that's engulfed the country. I mean, these, this is a clown show with these guys. I mean, they, they, the fact is that Leon Panetta was the director of the Central Intelligence Agency and had enormous influence at that point. The fact that the Obama administration adopted what was effectively the U.S. policy in Iraq when, when Bush left office says a tremendous amount about how little the Obama administration understood the disaster in Iraq. Um, had the United States kept in this, uh, this sort of strike force, which would have been uh, CIA paramilitaries, uh, special operations forces, um, it would have exacerbated the problem. The, the problem here isn't whether or not the U.S. forces would have been there to stabilize Iraq. The issue is how much worse are we going to make Iraq with, with these policies. And I think it's, it's imp almost impossible to imagine that this could have been handled in a worse way. Having more troops there, I mean, that's, that's uh, all of these guys, when they write their memoirs, have this brilliant 2020 vision looking backwards, that they, they were the one that knew, they, they would have done this differently. The U.S. basically, since 9-11, and you could make an argument that, that this has been U.S. policy for many, many decades, um, you know, U.S. policy has been its own uh, worst enemy in one sense. We've created uh, the very threats we claim to be fighting. Um, but on the other hand, if you, if you actually look at who benefits um, from this war, be beyond entities like ISIS, because they, they do benefit from this. Every time we kill civilians in drone strikes, al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula becomes uh, stronger in the sense that they have a greater uh, propaganda movement that they can roll out, uh, the war industry. 
You know, Lockheed Martin is uh, is making a killing off of the killing. Every every Tomahawk cruise missile that's launched, um, you know, the next generation of, of drone aircraft is going to be coming out. They're working on jet propelled drones that are going to be able to stay in the air for a very long time. The war industry is in it's in its twilight right now under Mr. Transformative Presidency Barack Obama. He's, he's, his administration has been an incredibly great friend to the war industry. And outside of, of some small groups of, of, of loony bins uh, that are in Syria and Iraq, the war industry is the greatest beneficiary of this policy. ISIS killing the journalists and the beheadings. Yeah, I mean, this is... First of all, you know, this has haunted me uh, a lot. I mean, obviously, as a journalist who's, who's worked in those areas, and I have a lot of friends now who are in those countries, um, you know, I was horrified at it. In watching the videos, though, and, I, you know, you, they were so, in, in both the case of, of, of James Foley and Stephen Sotloff, uh, they're so calm in the statements that they are, uh, are giving. And it's, it's, it's impossible to imagine that they know that they're going to be killed in those moments. And, you know, my suspicion, and, you know, I've done some reporting on this, um, is that they had been put in that position repeatedly and told, you know, you have to say this uh, statement. And in other words, they were subjected to mock executions over and over and over again. So, and, and if you notice in the videos, you don't actually see their heads being uh, cut off. Um, I think it's possible that, um, you know, that was like read number 31 for James Foley of, of this statement. And they took the best cut of that. And he may have been killed in another context, and then they, then they placed it there. Um, they have them in the orange jumpsuits. We know that they had been waterboarded. Uh, where, where does this come from? Uh, this is inspired by what we did uh, to Muslim prisoners around the world when we put them in gulags uh, in Poland and Thailand and elsewhere in these so-called black sites, when we took them to Guantanamo and, uh, and, and or we, we threatened their family, that, that we were going to kill their families, or we put them in small boxes where they couldn't lay down and couldn't stand up, and we, we brought in psychiatrists to, in a very sick, macabre way, um, investigate the, and exploit the fears of the Muslim prisoners that we took under the auspices of fighting terrorism. And, and we would stick people in boxes, and if they had a fear of spiders, we would put a caterpillar in the box and tell them it was a tarantula to try to terrify them. Um, you know, JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command, ran a torture factory in Iraq at a, uh, a camp called Camp Nama, which is nasty ASS military area, uh, where they were just torturing, torturing, torturing people, trying to find the next target to hit. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is, 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 these militants are adopting the very tactics that the United States used um, and, and continues to use against Muslims that it, it captures. And, uh, you know, the, the, there has never been a more intense, intensely dangerous time uh, for journalists. Um, on the one hand, you have episodes like this where journalists are being beheaded. Um, in Mexico, journalists are being gunned down by narco cartels or pro-government uh, forces for telling the truth and, and, and reporting. Um, freelancers and mostly Arab or Muslim journalists are on the front lines being killed in record numbers in, in Somalia as well. Uh, and then here at home, in the United States, there's a war against journalists and a war against whistleblowers. Um, the U.S. government is uh, intent on tracking who is giving information to journalists that is not officially cleared by the White House. Um, and, and the message that they're sending is we only want uh, the official statements to be out or our official leaks. When the Khorasan group popped out of nowhere and we're told, like, this is the greatest threat. In fact, there, on NBC News, there was a, a fantastic Brian Williams when he was announcing the, you know, the, 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 great, the new latest greatest threat <laughs> trademark. Um, he had, a, he had a graphic next to him that just said, the new enemy. And it's like, we, we could just take a picture of that, and every year, or apparently now it's going to be every two or three months, we can just have Brian Williams there with the new threat. It's, it could become an annual holiday in this country where we just celebrate whatever new war is going to give Lockheed Martin and Boeing and all these companies uh, tremendous profits. Um, you know, the, the, the age that we're living in now, where there's this war on journalists abroad by every possible force, and then this war at home, where journalists are being surveilled, uh, their sources are being uh, threatened with prosecution under the Espionage Act. Um, the Obama administration is in league with some of the most ruthless violators of human rights in the world in a campaign against the press. President Obama, the current president, uh, possible presidential contenders, for example, are Hillary Clinton. You wrote Dirty Wars while she was Secretary of State. What about her position on this? I mean, Hillary Clinton is— 
I, I actually think is more hawkish than Barack Obama. Barack Obama has emerged as a uh, as a, a pretty significant um, hawk in terms of his policies. He can talk all he wants about you know uh, how he wants to change and reset relationships around the world. This has been a, a total militarized presidency. Um, Hillary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State. Uh, acted as though she was also sort of Secretary of Defense, and her State Department was deeply involved with plotting uh, covert action around the world, using the State Department as cover uh, for CIA operations. Uh, and the, you know, the Clintons um, are, are, are uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton, are two of the most fierce projectors of the politics of the American empire. And, uh, and, and you know, they, they also have uh, very close relationships with um, some of the most uh, nefarious characters from the Bush uh, family. Uh, so, you know, those two families together, the Bushes and the Clintons, um, they're, it's almost like a monarchy in this country. I mean, Jeb Bush very well may run. I mean, it's, it's unclear what, you know, George W. Bush said the other day that he's, uh, you know, he's putting pressure on his brother to try to run for president. But, um, you know, Hillary Clinton is a, uh, a fierce neoliberal who believes in backing up the uh, so-called hidden hand of the free market um, with merciless, iron-fisted military policies. Let me ask you very quickly about Blackwater um, and the trial that's been going on. Jurors have been deliberating in the murder and manslaughter trial of the four former Blackwater operatives allegedly involved in the 2007 massacre at Baghdad's Nisar Square. The suspects are charged with the deaths of 14 of the 17 Iraqi civilians who died when their Blackwater unit indiscriminately opened fire. Right. I mean, this was the worst massacre of Iraqi civilians at the hands of uh, mercenaries, private contractors that we know of in Iraq. and. Um, you know, I don't know how the verdict is going to turn out, but what I do know is that the person who should be on trial um, is Eric Prince, who was the founder and ran Blackwater when it was essentially Murder Incorporated in Iraq, where there was an environment at that company where they were encouraged uh, to view every Iraqi as the enemy, and they com committed many massacres beyond what we know at Nisar Square. Uh, this is a microcosm of what happens all the time. It's always the people down the chain. Uh, that face the consequences. I believe that these men should be prosecuted, should be convicted uh, for what they did, and they should be in prison. Um, but the leadership of Blackwater should also be there. And until we as a society uh, stop um, uh, cutting off who's held accountable at the lowest ranks, nothing is ever going to fundamentally change. Jeremy Scaho, thanks so much for being with us. His new book, Dirty Wars, The World is a Battlefield. Well, the New York Times bestseller is now out in paperback, and that does it for the show. Uh,